Hi, welcome to New Hope Community Church Online. The sermon you are about to hear was originally given by Pastor Chuck Wilson. New Hope Community Church, to know, to live, and to share Jesus Christ. The title for today is The Passover Mission Accomplished. Mission Completed, Mission Accomplished, Joshua 5.10. And uh, I want to start off with talking about uh, military for a minute. How, any of our military people, please stand up, men and women. Anybody in the military, I need you to stand up for me. Just stand up. I'm not going to put you on the spot. just want you to stand up. All right, I know I got more. Come on, every, come on. Uh, come on, you got up, 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 up. Jim, I'm looking at you. All right, all right. So, all right, so let's first of all give these guys a hand, first of all. <clears throat> all right, all right. Now you can sit down, but I'm asking you, does this sound familiar to any of you guys? If you've, you hurry up and, wait, wait. <laughs> that's why I did, hurry up and wait. Uh, if you've ever been in the military, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, hurry up and wait, very frustrating. What are officers thinking? What are they doing? You know, why did we have to all rush out and stand here in the hot sun or wherever in the rain or whatever and just wait? And the Israelites had to be feeling the same way. They had to be feeling the same way here in Joshua chapter 5, thinking the same thing. They hurry over the river. Remember, if you weren't here, get the CDs or podcast them. Uh, But they hurried over the river, remember, because the priests were holding the ark in the middle of the the flooded river that had parted, you know, that stopped flowing miraculously for them. They hurried over. But instead of starting the invasion, God commanded them to have all the men circumcised which we'll talk a little bit more about that, which was crazy. And now we'll see that not only did, were they circumcised, they hurry over, they get circumcised, and now they are commanded to celebrate the Passover. That'd be like D-Day. The D-Day invasion, they get to the beaches and they say, okay, let's have a picnic on the beach. You know, it's just crazy to, to do what they were doing here. If you pull out the insert, there's an insert in the bulletin, you can kind of follow along and take this with you at home. But we're going to kind of follow along and watch this crazy command that God gives them here. Let's uh, pray first. So, Father, we thank you for the worship today, and we thank you for focusing us on your son Jesus Christ and communion this morning. I know we all have been through a lot this week, and probably even this morning been through a lot and battled through some things. But, Father, we pray that your spirit would speak to us through your mercy and grace, through your word. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Joshua 5, verse 10. We're all going to get through one. I tried to go further, and I got hit, hit the wall. So we, one verse did it all. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The Passover. Now, this, as I mentioned, is crazy. They had already stopped to circumcise themselves, right? Which left them completely helpless and defenseless. Jericho could have marched out and wiped out the whole nation of the Israelites right there because they were all circumcised. And we talked about this last time, getting rid of the baggage. If you weren't there, grab, get the CD podcast. We talked about how God was sending them, them and us a very clear message. Before we can see spiritual victory, before we can experience the spiritual blessings in our life, we must commit ourselves to holiness. And we have mentioned how holiness hurts. <laughs> Circumcision hurt. Holiness hurts. And now they're finally healed up, and you would expect marching orders. Let's march on and let's take this, right? We would expect marching orders. No, uh, they didn't go to orders to march and, and attack Jericho. They were ordered to celebrate a religious feast, the Passover, that they hadn't celebrated in almost 40 years. It's crazy. Why? Well, first of all, why didn't they celebrate the Passover for 40 years? They were faithless. Same reason they hadn't circumcised their kids. They were faithless. They were faithless, and that's why they're all dead in the desert. But, it, it, and it seems like a crazy thing that God is asking them to do here, too, just like the circumcision. Crazy. Once again, this leaves them vulnerable. They're out having a religious feast and all eating and all celebrating and, and celebrating the Passover. And that's crazy, right? You don't do that when you're in the shadow of the enemy. You, you know, they should have done it on the other side of the river. Remember, we talked about that whole thing last time. It left them vulnerable, right? Wrong. Uh, Exodus 34. In Exodus 34, when God was talking about 
the Passover and celebrating the Passover. In Exodus 34, starting with verse 18, he says, Celebrate the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Abib, for in that month you came out of Egypt. Talking about the Passover. Down a couple more verses. Verse 22. Celebrate the Feast of Weeks with the first fruit of the wheat harvest and the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year all your men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out the nations before you and enlarge your territory. And no one will covet your land when you go up three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. For seven days during the Passover, they are under divine protection. Divine protection. They didn't have to worry about, they're in the shadow of Jericho. They didn't have to worry about the Canaanites and, and the termites. Remember we talked about that all last week. All these being attacked, they didn't have to worry because they were under divine protection protection when they're celebrating the Passover here. And just, and, and God's making a point, just as God protected them in Egypt from the angel of death, right? The first Passover, now he will protect them from death as they celebrate Passover in enemy territory. Divine protection. Important lesson here. If we are, if we are in God's will, doing things God's way, we are completely safe. Nothing can touch us. Did you realize that? Doesn't matter if you're in a war zone, serving in the military, that's where God wants you. Doesn't matter if you are in the middle of a riot somewhere, in the, some city in a riot. Doesn't mean it matter if you're in a dangerous country where there's lots of persecution. I've seen some things, Listen, let me tell you. Uh, you know, been there and done that, but, I, but if, if we are in God's will, we're, more, we're safer there in a war, in a riot, in a country where there's intense persecution. We're safer there than we are in our, our home in the suburbs, if that's where you live. We're safer th there than if we're in our own bed. We're safer there than driving our own car. We're safer there if we're in God's will. If we're in God's will, nothing can touch us unless he allows it for his purpose. Very, very important lesson. So we see the Passover here. It comes from Exodus 12. And in Exodus 12, they were in the book of Exodus, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. God sends Moses, says, let my people go. You've all seen the movies, you know, the, the old one or the new one. And then they, Pharaoh said, no. God said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, no. And so God sends the 10 plagues. And the 10th plague, each one got worse and worse and worse. The 10th plague was the... But that's right, the death of the firstborn of every firstborn son in Egypt. The death, the angel of death was coming through to kill them. But God gave the Israelites a special feast, the Passover, where they slaughtered, each family slaughtered a lamb. And then they would eat the lamb together. They put the blood on the door, the top and the sides of the door, shape of the cross. We've talked about that many, many times. And then the angel of death spared the firstborn spared the firstborn uh, wherever they, he found the blood on the door, which was the Israelites' homes. And this is a picture of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of the work of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of what he did on the cross, the blood on the door, the, the, the shape of the cross. It, it was fulfilled by Jesus, and it's remembered by Christians now through communion. Through communion. The Israelites... And, and, and we today are connected this way. We're connected. It's the same picture. The Israelites is a picture, a physical picture of a spiritual reality for us. Before they could enter the promised land, what did they have to do? They had to cross the river. They had to circumcise themselves. And then they had, then they had, to, be, then they had to celebrate the Passover. Before we can live a victorious Christian life, before we can live a victorious Christian life that we're called to live, we have to walk through that river. We have to take the step of faith through the judgment, following Joshua through that river. We have to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And then we have to be holy. Circumcision is a picture of holiness. We have to be committed to holiness, and we also have to be under the blood. Passover, we have to be under the blood and in communion with Jesus Christ. 
It's all a picture. The Passover is a picture of our spiritual walk and battle and also fulfilled by communion itself. I want to look at the connections between Passover and communion and what it means for us before we, we take the communion today. We'll start in Exodus 12 where the, we find the Passover. And in Exodus 12, 1, it says this. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you in the first month, the first month of the year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small, oh, I'll just stop right there. So we see the lamb, the lamb is key. Each, each one takes the lamb, all right? Then we go to Luke 22. I'm guessing you, a lot of you know where I'm going with this. And Luke 22, starting with verse 14, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Jesus fulfilled the Passover, and he instituted communion at that same time. As he was getting ready to fulfill the Passover, he instituted communion, the Lord's Supper. Now remember, the Passover lamb that they were eating was a substitute. A substitute. Who should have died? The firstborn of each family in Egypt. The firstborn son, right? Should have died. But the lamb died instead. And then you, they put the blood on the doors, and they ate the lamb that was a substitute. That lamb saved them, saved their lives. Jesus, as he's talking about here in Luke 22, he is the ultimate substitute. He's the ultimate lamb. He fulfilled the, the lamb, you know, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He fulfilled that prophetic picture here. And he is our substitute if we will put our faith in him. If we do that, God will spare us. If we put our faith, just as they killed the lamb, we put our faith in the lamb who was slain for us in our place. If we put our faith in him, God will forgive our sin. He will spare us. Romans 3.23 talks about this. He says, For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. That's what, Jesus, that's what God did by sacrificing his son, the lamb, in our place. He was a sacrifice of atonement at one minute with God again. And, and, and that's what Jesus did for us. Imagine, imagine this. Imagine you are on death row. You've done something terrible and you are going to be executed. You're on death row. There is no escape. Imagine the hopeless feeling that you would have, knowing that you are going to be, be executed for something you've done, and there's no way out. And then at the last minute, someone comes and takes your place. They come in, knock on the door, chaplain, whoever knocks on the door says, I'll take their place, let them go, and you go free. Can, can you imagine the hopelessness and then the relief we feel? That's exactly what Jesus did for us. We were all on death row. Not just physical death, which we're all going to face, but spiritual death, eternal death. We were, every one of us was facing an eternity in hell, separated from God. Eternity, no hope. But Jesus Christ was sacrificed for us. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. If we will put our faith in Jesus, we are set free from that death row. We are set free from judgment. We are given eternal life. The, 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 the moment we put our faith in Christ, we are given a whole new life here and an eternal life with God someday. We are set free from that judgment. Exodus 12, verse 6 says this. Another parallel here. In Exodus 12, verse 6 says this, take care of them, talking about the sheep, until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over fire along with the bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. We see that the blood had to be applied and they had to eat the meat. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23 says this, 
For I re received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we see just as the, the blood and the, the, the meat of the lamb, we see here in 1 Corinthians, the, the bread represents the body of Christ and the cup represents the blood of Christ. Both are a picture of the death, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins. And just as the eating of the Passover lamb prepared the Israelites to take the promised lamb, we need to feed on Jesus Christ. How symbolically by taking the bread and drinking the cup, we, we, that's a picture of communing with Jesus in order to win our spiritual victories. Very, very important. The Passover was to, for the Exodus and then to enter the land and, and the, our Passover, the communion is for our spiritual victories. Very important that we are connected. This is just a reminder that we need, need to commune with God every day, all day long, all the time. We need to be communing with him, connecting with him in order to win our spiritual victories. Exodus 12, 14. Exodus 12, 14, another one where it says, this is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. It's a, to commemorate. It's a memorial. How God delivered the Israelites from Egypt. It was a very important a memorial. 1 Corinthians 11. 24 and 25, I just read them. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. It's, it's, a, it's a memorial. It's a remembering. Both are meant to remind us how God delivered us from bondage. The Israelites from bondage to slavery, us from bondage to slavery to sin. We were in slavery to sin, but God delivered us. He, he forgave us. He set us free. It's, a, it's, a, it's to remind us and it's to remember that Jesus Christ was sacrificed for us. They were looking forward. The lamb was sacrificed. They were looking forward to the lamb of God being sacrificed someday. They didn't understand it completely and fully, but it was a prophetic picture that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. We are looking backward at the lamb that was slain for us. That, that, was, that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ's death on the cross for us. He died in our place so that we could go free. He died in our place so that we wouldn't face God's judgment. He took divine justice, God's wrath on himself. Then another verse, uh, Exodus 12, 43, very interesting one here. In Exodus 12, 43 it says, he said, the, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the regulations for the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it. No foreigners. Nobody who is not a Jew could eat the Passover. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29 says this. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29 says, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Now here, this is it. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body and the blood, body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Very important. You must be, a, the only way you recognize the body of Christ is you have to be a Christian. Very important that only a Christian takes the Lord's Supper. Very, very important. A foreigner could not take the Passover. Back to the Passover. A foreigner could not take the Passover unless they did something radical. The same is for someone who isn't a Christian, should not take the Lord's Supper unless they take a radical step. What is that radical step? Back to, back to Exodus 12. In Exodus 12, we see the only way they could take it in verse 48. An alien living among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his household circumcised. Ouch. Then he may take part like the one in the land. No uncircumcised 
male may eat of it. The same law applies to the native born and to the alien living among you. Just as Israelites had to be circumcised in order to take Passover, a foreigner could also do the same. And I'll, jump, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Jumping ahead to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30, where it says, That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned by, by the wor with the world. He's talking about spiritual circumcision. Just as before they could eat the Passover, they had to be circumcised. We talked about that last week. We saw that last week. It was a picture of cutting out sin. It's a type of cutting out sin. The Israelites had to be circumcised, and a foreigner had to be circumcised before they could take it. And that's a picture of cutting out sin. That's what circumcision is. It's the same thing for the Lord's Supper. Before we can eat the Lord's Supper, all sin must be confessed and repented of. If someone is not a Christian, they have to put their faith in Christ. An important part of faith is, an important part of that is confessing, repenting, turning away from our old life and following Jesus Christ and putting our faith in him. And then as, even as Christians, very important, we have to continually be spiritually circumcised in order to take the Lord's Supper. Very, very important. All sin must be confessed and repented of. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 5, Verses 6 to 8, it says this. Starting with verse 6, we see the connection here. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. And he's stressing here how important it is. Yeast is a type of sin, and it couldn't be part of the Passover. That's why they ate unleavened bread. Same thing with, with communion. It's unleavened bread. That's, that's a, a, uh, the yeast is a picture of sin and how important it is to get rid of that. Whether it's the Passover or the communion, no leaven. Before we can commune with the holy God, before we can connect, we must get rid of sin. Before we can become a Christian, the first time, it's not just believe in Jesus, there has to be repentance. God, I repent of my old life. I repent of sin. I turn away from that. And now I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to put my faith in Jesus and give my life to him. Very, very important. And then after we become a Christian, after we take that step of faith, it's still very important. If we, we're, we're a Christian, but then in order to stay in close communion and close fellowship with him, there has to be that continual confession of sin, getting rid of sin in our life. Very, very important. Imagine... imagine who's, think of the most famous person you would just love to sit down with and... and, and Go out to dinner with, sit down for a fancy meal and talk to. Imagine that person. Maybe it's a sports celebrity, maybe it's a politician, whatever. Somebody really famous, you would love to just sit. Can you imagine, though, you get invited to a dinner with that person. Picture this person. You get invited to that dinner, and you show up all dirty. Dirty hands, you just worked on the car, you got oil all over your hands, grease, you know, or you're just doing lawn work and you didn't have time to take a shot. Can you imagine showing, nobody would do that. You would be cleaned up and put on your best stuff. It, it would be unthinkable to show up, but that's the picture. That's why confession is so important. We are meeting with the Holy God through his son, Jesus Christ. And we can't have a speck of dirt on us. It's got to be confessed. It's got to be forgiven. And it's there for the asking. We're going to see that in just a minute. It's there for the asking. But it's hard to imagine how God views sin in our life. He's holy. And he can't have it in his presence. That's why he sent his son Jesus to die for us. He, he loved his son so much, but he sent him to die for us because that was the only way to wipe the sin off of us. Only Jesus could do it. When I... I've told this story a while back. Some of you may remember it. I remember I'd be on the farm. I grew up on a farm, and, and we had a barnyard. All farms do. And we had this barnyard, and the barnyard had cement on the bottom, but over time, the, the cement would break up, and you had to be careful where you walked because there would be all of these little holes where you'd step in, and you'd be up to your knees or something. But, but this one spot in the barnyard, off, just off the cement edge, 
there was a, a, an underground spring. It was like quicksand. It was like a bog. And we all knew. It was right off the edge, and cows knew, and we knew. Stay away from that, because it will go down far. In fact, one time, uh, one of the kids, one of our friends, stepped in it and lost his shoe. And, and so we were, we were, I took a stick, and we were trying to save his shoe. We were trying to find it. And I just remember we just went down, down, down. I never found that shoe, and I never found the bottom to this, this quicksand manure pit. You never found the bottom. And uh, so one day, another friend of mine was going, with, helping me, our friends would come over and help us, you know, and, and he said, his name was Peter, and he said, uh, hey, I want to go help you get the cows today, and I said, okay, but stay right behind me, walk where I walk, because we're going through the barnyard, and it just rained, and it was, you couldn't really see where the cement was, and so it was a lot, a lot of manure, and so I said, follow me, we'll walk right where I walk, and he said, okay, okay, but this kid was a real know-it-all, he wasn't listening to me, I said, step where I step, and so I walked across the barnyard, and I got across out to where the pasture was starting, safe spot, and all of a sudden I heard, Chucky, help me! And uh, and I and I turn. Around. I was probably about twelve, and he was probably eight years old at the time. And I turn around, and he had stepped into the pit, the manure pit, the the quicksand. But it wasn't sand; it was something much worse. And he was sinking. He was up to his knees. I'm like, why didn't you follow me? Help me! Help me! You know, and he's sinking. I get to him. And he's up to his waist. Right? He's up to his waist. And I'll never forget. I grab a hold of him and I'm pulling and pulling and he's just sucking him down, sucking him down. He was up to his chest. And, and then he just had one arm out and his head out. And I'm like, they'll never believe me. I'm going to go to prison for this. You know, you know uh, I don't know where the kid went. Yeah, he got, and I'm pulling on him, pulling on him. And I'm screaming, help, help, help. He's screaming because I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to lose this kid, right? I'm pulling and he's screaming. And, and my, my mom finally hears, what are those boys up to? She was in the barn feeding little calves or something. She comes out. <gasps> I saw her eyes like this. She was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose the farm. They're going to sue me. So she goes running out, you know, and, and, and she grabbed, and I'm slapping sliding into the pit. Now, I'm up to my knees, sliding down the side of it, and, and Peter's like, just got his head and his arm out, and I'm pulling, and my mom's pulling on me, and little by little, little by little, first I got out, and then together we slowly pulled him out of this manure pit. It was unbelievable. He gets out, and he, by then, it was head to toe, head to toe. Manure, disgusting. And, and he's like crying, you know, I'm covered with manure. I go, it's okay, I'll get you cleaned up, Pete. I'll get you cleaned up. I took him over outside the milk house, and I got a hose, and I just started spraying him. It's just running down, you know. Then I put it inside of his shirt, and I'm spraying, and it's just running down. And it was coming out of his pants. It was everywhere it could be. Man, just disgusting, right? You know, it's in his mouth. It's everywhere, right? And he's like crying, and he lived with his grandmother at the time, and, and he was, she lived across the road, and he was living with his grandmother, and he's like, my grandmother's going to kill me. My grandmother's going to kill me. I can't go home like this. She's going to kill me. I go, no, Pete, she'll just be happier alive. She'll just be happier alive. It's okay. It's going to be okay. And I just kept saying that to him, and I said, it's okay, and I started walking him home. We went across the road, and I'm walking him home, and he's like sloshing, and he's still got manure everywhere, but it's, you know, coming out of his pants still, and, and he's well, sloshing. And he goes, it's, he's crying. My mom, grandma's going to come in. No, she's just going to be happier breathing still, Pete. It's okay. And I got up to the door. She's not going to be upset with you, Pete. She's not. We walked up to the store. I rang the doorbell and I ran because I knew she'd kill me too. You know, she's going to be mad, you know. But can you imagine? He wanted to go face his grandmother like this. And, and that's a picture, a disgusting picture. That's what sin on us is like. That's how disgusting we are in God's sight with sin. That's why he gave his son Jesus to die for us. For that very reason. We have to confess and be forgiven and wash clean. The blood of Jesus Christ washes it clean. It's not like that oath. The blood of Christ washes it clean. Are we ready to commune with God this morning? Are we ready to come into his presence before we can have a relationship, before we can even commune with him, before we have a relationship, we must cross the river. We talked about this many times. We must put our faith. It takes that step of faith. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Have you ever believed in Jesus? Put your faith in him, given your life to him, confessed the sin and walked away from it and put your faith in Jesus Christ. Have you ever taken that step of faith? Are you ready to commune with him today and every day? And maybe you're here, you said, yeah, I've done that. I put my faith in Christ. But in order to move forward in the Christian walk, we don't only have to cross the river. 
We've talked about that. But in order to walk, move forward in our Christian walk and in our Christian life, we must circumcise sin. We must circumcise sin. We must cut out sin. And it's a continuous thing. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That is a continuous daily thing. Constantly that confession and, and being cleansed is a constant, constant thing. And then after we put our faith in Christ, and after sin has been confessed and repented of, now we can commune with him. Not just here, but this is just a reminder that he, we can commune with him every day, every hour, every minute, every second. He wants to be connected with us. And as we take communion today, the bread and the cup are a reminder that Jesus gave his body and blood for us in our place. He was the Passover lamb. And a reminder that we need communion daily. We need to commune, commune daily with him to, in order to have that spiritual strength to, to claim what has been promised to us. Our promises, our promised land. That's what communion is is all about. I'm going to just close with one story before we go to prayer. I saw an article in the paper years ago. I just have kept it. And I remembered it for, the, for today. It says, daughter's sudden death saves father through heart transplant. It says, for Chester Suber, it was the gift of life, but at a cost so dear he almost didn't accept it. The youngest of his six children, a 22-year-old nursing student, had been killed in a car accident, and it quickly became clear that her heart could be his. The family had little time to decide. He needs his heart transplant. The family had little t time to decide, but uh, his wife insisted that he take it because he, she said, your daughter would want you to have this heart. In the end, it was his decision he said it would be a joy to have Patty's heart. On Monday, Patty's heart was flown from the Tennessee hospital where she had died to Michigan, where Chester Super 58 was off a breathing machine by the morning after the surgery and was in good condition. This sacrifice is very similar to, but also very different from the sacrifice God made with his son. This man had five more children. It was a terrible sacrifice, but he had five more children. God sacrificed his only, one and only son. And God gave his son to save us, not to save himself. He gave his son to save us. And it wasn't an accident, a car accident. It was on purpose that he did it. And just as this man had to take his daughter's heart to live, we have to take Jesus Christ into our hearts in order to live now and forever. Are we ready for communion? Let's pray. As we go to this time of communion, we're just going to have a little time of prayer here and then open it up for communion. You can just come forward and take it whenever you're ready. If you're not ready, that's okay. You don't have to take it. The only reason why we shouldn't is, number one, if we're not a Christian and not ready to become a Christian yet, we should wait for that time when we're ready. Or if there's sin in our life that we won't confess, that we won't surrender. Not that we don't struggle with, we, we all struggle with sin. But if we're not willing to surrender it this morning and say, God, forgive me. I confess it. I'm asking for your mercy and grace to fight this. If we're not willing for a certain area of our life, then we should wait. Very serious. But I hope everyone here does put their faith in Christ. Everyone here does surrender whatever needs to be surrendered. Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian yet, and this could be the day that you take the step of faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his one 
and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You can have that life right now. You can put your faith in Jesus right now. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Is God pulling on your heart right now? You can pray that prayer in your heart to God. God, please forgive me. Anything I've ever done wrong against your word, I repent of that. Please forgive me. Because I'm putting my faith in Jesus. I'm putting my faith, my trust in Jesus, the Passover lamb who died in my place, who died on the cross for me. I give you my life, God. If you have taken that step of faith through the river, if you've prayed that prayer of faith, you have just become a Christian. God's spirit is living inside of you. You no longer have to f fear judgment or death or anything because you are now God's child and you can commune with him. You can talk to him anytime as your heavenly father, as your loving father. And taking communion this morning is just a reminder of that for you now, that you can talk to him anytime, connect with him anytime. If you have prayed that prayer of faith and given your life to Christ, I want to encourage you to let somebody know. Whether it's someone you came with, someone you know, tell me on the way out, fill out the card, let somebody know. Because we're going to be excited for you and we're going to help you and encourage you in your new life in Christ. For those of us who have already put our faith in Christ, how is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? What are we being convicted of? What do we need to confess to God? What do we need to cut out of our life? What do we need to repent of? What is keeping us from a close relationship with God that he wants so much that he sacrificed his own son so he could have this relationship? What are we, what are we trading? What manure pit are we in that, that we're trading that intimacy with God for something, for garbage, for something that's not going to fulfill us, that's going to leave us feeling empty? Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts now, that you would fill us in a special way, that you would meet with us in an intimate way that we would know the peace and the joy and the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. I pray that that would be what motivates us to live the Christian life, the love that you've shared with us through, through your son Jesus Christ. That would be what motivates us and what helps us persevere in the battles and that's what guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Pray this in Jesus' name.